Hi, Dr. Halmos. Thanks so much for joining me today to discuss COVID-19. Um, why don't we start off with providing me a little bit of what you know so far about the virus? Yeah, thank you so much for having me in the first place. Um, uh, you know, we certainly know a lot more about COVID-19 than we expected to know just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, of course, you know, this is a coronavirus uh, that appears to have jumped, you know, species. Uh, and uh, started an epidemic of significant proportions in China and now has spread throughout the world and is currently at its height uh, at its peak in Europe, Western Europe, as well as here in the United States, especially in certain parts of the state, such as where I work in New York City, where the numbers are just staggering. Uh, uh, you know, rushing us to you know, reconsider our practices as to how we take care of patients both you know, patients with COVID-19 who come to our hospitals in very large numbers, but also our cancer patients uh, at the same time who continue to need our attention and continue to require the proper care uh, for their disease to be taken care of. And in the middle of this epidemic, you know, let me just remind us that this is a respiratory pathogen, uh, which uh, seems to be highly, highly contagious. So it, it's, a, it's a very specific concern not just in terms of overwhelming the healthcare system, but potentially infecting, contaminating uh, you know, our patients as they come in for their care. So it has, it has multiple different elements that make it very complicated for our patients to receive the right care, but we all need to you know, come to work and you know, figure out ways to be able to provide that. Perfect. So obviously the COVID-19 situation continues to rapidly evolve. How is your institution responding to recent developments? Well, we've implemented a lot of changes and institutions, you know, who will need to make these changes maybe later, later on, they just need to learn that the changes that they make one day and they'll change the next day. This is such a rapidly evolving epidemic that we all need to be highly, highly flexible, adapting to really day-to-day -day needs, you know, both in terms of staffing, you know, resource utilization, and also just simply, you know, physical, uh, you know, plants uh, uh, you know, as well. For example, my institution, Montefiore Healthcare System, is a fairly large health system where we see cancer patients in multiple performance sites. One of the first things that we decided to do is to move all of our cancer patients into one facility, uh, one facility that's freestanding, meaning that we can provide very safe access to the facility, screening every person entering the building, screening every patient entering the building, providing masks you know, to each and every patient as they come in, and making sure that our providers have appropriate PPE as well through uh, the patient care experience. So, you know, we've, we've made that decision very early on. I think we're very happy that we did. That way we can minimize any potential for, uh, uh, you know, uh, infecting our cancer patients who are you know, very vulnerable, of course. Good points. Um, so obviously we know that the infection with the virus is resulting in several respiratory complications, right? And I guess working in lung cancer, are you finding it difficult to differentiate between symptoms associated with cancer versus the infection? You know, of course, that can be a challenging you know, question, especially with many of our agents. Uh, pulmonary complications can be an issue, such as with checkpoint inhibitors, for example, pneumonitis, but also targeted agents you know, can lead to lung complications. And on top of that, many of our patients receive radiation that leads to a number of changes on the patient's CAT scan can also lead to pneumonitis, and all those can mimic, in a way, uh, the changes that we can see with a COVID-19 infection. So yes, indeed, it can be a major challenge. Uh, now, of course, if we had rapid testing for COVID-19, this challenge would be greatly diminished because we could very quickly screen, you know, know if a patient is positive or negative. And this is where I think we're making major advances. Uh, as uh, the epidemic arrived in New York City two weeks ago, the testing took you know, three to five days. Now we have in-house testing. You know, this is a PCR-based test. So in a way, it's not a very complicated test for a molecular lab to run. And you know, our molecular pathologists recruited very eager and smart medical students who you know, work 24 hours a day. So you know, for in-house patients where rapid testing is needed, really we can turn it around in a couple of hours. And I think that's key because without the availability of rapid testing, how do we make those decisions? So I'm super happy that you know, we're able to offer that to our patients and providers, but yes, indeed, it does remain a challenge and a challenge that you know, we need to be able to resolve to be able to offer the right treatment to our patients. And then I'm, I'm wondering too, um, 
is this challenge kind of amplified? Like, are you, have you shifted to the use of telemedicine yet? Are you doing video interviews? Or of video course, of course. You know, we had to implement so many different practices. And in a way, you know, as PPE is so important, you know, we sort of, you know, uh, decided to use the mnemonic PPE. You know, it's about, you know, preventing, you know, patients to get infected, protecting them through their care and, and in, enabling them to receive, you know, the right care throughout. So, you know, starting, you know, with, uh, you know, the prevention, of course, if, if we can avoid patients having to come in, and they can you know, receive visits through their home environment, or maybe visits can just be deferred. That's probably the safest way to manage them. So for example, patients who just need to come in for every six monthly visits, those visits can be delayed. If patients just had a CAT scan and the CAT scan results are negative, we can discuss them very well over the phone. Patients might not need to come in. But of course, there's many patients who will need to come in for appropriate care. And that's where we need to protect them. We need to protect them through their, you know, through experience. And that's about, you know, bringing them into safe facilities, you know, providing the type of uh, safe environment that I mentioned to, mention to you earlier, which we very quickly uh, were able to do. And in, in part, thanks to our colleagues in China and Italy, we've learned from their experience and, you know, we're, you know, we're able to introduce that early on. So, you know, providing that safe, safe, safe environment is very important. And then through the care experience, we might need to make some modifications for the treatments to be safer. You mentioned about lung complications, you know, potentially be complex in terms of figuring out is that from COVID-19, is that from treatment? But in reality, a patient receiving, let's say, aggressive chemotherapy, even if there's no diagnostic dilemma, if they have a life-threatening infection in the middle of aggressive chemotherapy when their immune system is suppressed, the outcome will be a lot worse than it might be otherwise. So wherever possible, we need to maybe diminish the aggressiveness of chemotherapy, delay some treatments, uh, limit the number of visits you know, that might need to be required, offer oral agents as opposed to intravenous agents, and also you know, potentially uh, uh, offering other cho choices such as deferring the start of treatment uh, for certain patients. But let's say coming to checkpoint inhibition, some of these agents can be given at a lighter schedule, maybe not every two weeks, but every four weeks, you know, limiting, you know, the experience, you know, the potential exposure, exposure for our patients that way. Have you had any um, cases of COVID that you're specifically treating or colleagues that you know are specifically treating that maybe you wanted to discuss how you're approaching treatment and kind of addressing those disruptions in care? Yeah, we, 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 we have, of course, many patients undergoing treatment and for each and every one of them, you know, we're looking at ways to minimize, minimize their potential exposure. Now we've had some patients, unfortunately, with COVID-19 as well. We've had some you know, fatal outcomes, but actually we just had a discharge just yesterday, very surprisingly in a patient on chemotherapy where I thought, oh my goodness, you know, this, this, this is a lovely but very frail patient might not pull through, but, but she did. So, you know, there's definitely hope, you know, we need to provide the right treatment, right support to, uh, you know, their you know, patient experience, even with COVID-19. Our facilities are completely being revamped. New ICUs are being opened up left and right. I'm, I'm very impressed, uh, honestly, not just with how institutions have responded to it, you know, in the city, but just healthcare workers, uh, you know, giving up, you know, their, you know, extra time, volunteering, um, being willing to be redeployed to new units. This is definitely a, a time that unifies, you know, the healthcare worker environment, uh, and we have to, we have to, uh, you know, pay a lot of, lot of kudos to our, you know, nursing staff and supporting staff uh, to, to, to be willing to do that. And of course, we fortunately have some physician champions as well, you know, pulling, pulling the extra burden as well. And I'm also hearing a lot that um, a lot of the information and education, aside from sites like OnClive, is being disseminated on Twitter, right? The community, the, on, the medical community is kind of coming together and sharing experiences on that platform as well, right? I mean, it's incredible how, you know, medical education became just such a whirlwind experience. In a heartbeat, you learn about, you know, major developments and now with COVID-19, I think that, that that's gotten even more amplified. You know, the content is just amazing. And of course, we all quickly steal ideas and information and share it with our colleagues in-house. So yes, indeed, Twitter has become an incredible resource uh, uh, that uh, I, I 
greatly appreciate uh, being able to use. But it's not just Twitter. It's, of course, uh, for example, your team, Unclive, PER, you know, other um, uh, educational um, entities, you know, are, are doing a great job as well. So keep up the good work. Thank you. Um, so I guess shifting back to practice, what would you say is the latest challenge that you are facing in practice on both a personal level and kind of an institutional level with regard to COVID-19? Well, you know, we, we mentioned, you know, the prevention and protection. We, we didn't talk about the enabling part, the PPE of, you know, how to manage patient care. And, you know, it, it's very challenging because in this growing situation, so many things are shifting that you, you don't know, you don't know how to provide the right care. Um, it's one thing to prevent, you know, them, you know, from getting the infection, protecting them through their care, but can you actually provide the right care? It's very frustrating for us physicians who are used to, yes, you know, we can, we can provide a standard of care, but hopefully, uh, you know, beyond. And now we have to compromise to the point that, well, many times we're unable to provide a standard of care. Is there a reasonable compromise where you can feel comfortable as a clinician that in the middle of this epidemic, you're offering treatment choices to patients who that are not crazy, that do provide the ability to, to manage the disease, you know, to the best of, uh, you know, your abilities in the middle of this situation. And just, just a couple of examples, you know, how do you provide cancer care when there's no surgery that's being performed? Number one, how do you provide cancer care where you cannot, you know, get diagnostic procedures such as a bronchoscopy, which used to be, you know, bread and butter, you know, everyday, you know, uh, issue for a pulmonary oncologist to, to, to be able to pursue. So very basic elements of care are suddenly missing completely. Can you temporize the situation? Can you offer some treatment so that the surgery could be deferred, reasonable safety could still be offered? Many times we just don't know. You know, we're coming up with some makeshift decisions. And this is again where I have to say that social media is fantastic, that you're learning from others. How did they resolve a situation? Guidelines are very quickly you know, being put out as to how institution A versus institution B you know, dealt with it. And that gives the clinician a level of comfort that I'm not alone in this. You know, we're all struggling, but we're coming up with reasonable decisions, the best decisions under the circumstances. So that's one aspect in terms of how to compromise in a reasonable way to still enable your patient to receive appropriate cancer care. And the second aspect is the emotional element where it's one thing that we're anxious too as healthcare workers in this environment. We can be exposed, we can get very sick. We've lost you know, nurses, we've lost a lot of physicians just in New York during just the last couple of days. But how about the patients, you know, dealing with a life-threatening illness and then facing this terrible epidemic and they might be admitted to the hospital, then they cannot be visited by, by their family members, key decisions, you know, that we need to make with them, you know, hospice transition, things of that nature, that level of comfort that their loved ones can be with them um, is just not there. So. We all need to go the extra mile, and we're learning day by day how to, how to do that uh, in a practical way to, to still provide the care, the compassion, the attention that patients need. When again, some of the basic elements of how we've, we've gotten used to providing this type of care are just, just missing. Very good points, and beautifully said, honestly. Um, are there any ongoing research efforts that you wanted to highlight that you're hearing more about re with regard to the virus? Well, of course, um, you know, we have, we have a fantastic healthcare system on a certain level in the States and, you know, worldwide, and the, the, the scientific machine, you know, got started. So, you know, I think, I think there's been some delays in terms of getting things going in the States, but by now everybody's attention is there. I'm, I'm very impressed. I'm, I'm amazed, you know, by how quickly clinical research, you know, got, got going. In our institution, as well as I'm sure in many others, now there's clinical studies looking at novel antiviral agents, novel agents to block, um, you know, the cytokine um, storm, you know, that, that's associated with this uh, COVID-19 virus. There's new clinical trials that now take the serum for, from patients who recovered, you know, from the viral infection and basically treat critically ill patients with that. So there's many, many elements of that and hopefully vaccine studies, you know, will be here very soon as well. So I'm, I'm very impressed, I'm very amazed by the speed of science and hopefully that will 
provide a lot of dividends, but not today, not tomorrow, within the next couple of months. So within that period of time, we just need to do our absolute best, you know, with the resources, with the tools that we have to keep our patients um, uh, safe uh, and as healthy as possible. Thank you. My last question is kind of, what's your advice to your colleagues working through all of these challenges and facing all of these hurdles caused by COVID-19? What, what, what's your advice to them? I think this is a very stressful time. And uh, you know, one thing you know, that we all need to learn is to be super flexible. This is where you need to adapt to the changes very quickly. Second of all, I think this is truly a, a unifying moment you know, for us uh, working in healthcare. And, and we need to cherish in a way and embrace that and, and learn from our colleagues and work with them. You know, this is not the type, time of competition. This is a time of working together. And uh, I'm, I'm starting to see that that's happening. And, and I, I just want to encourage all of our colleagues to continue to, you know, to put our best effort together as, as a team to pull through this incredible, incredible, challenging time. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Helmos. Please Thank stay safe. Thank you so much for the invite. Uh, Thank you for everything that you're doing.